Hey everybody, Josh here. Welcome back to my channel. If you don't already know, I do a lot of videos on IT, cybersecurity, education, and career type things. And today's video is just going to be a continuation of the cybersecurity kind of interview series that I've been doing. And the first question of the day is how to strengthen user authentication. So no matter what kind of authentication you're using, whether it's like username and password or like a, a token or some kind of biometric, if you add an additional factor to that, uh, of course, it will increase uh, strength. So for example, if you're just using plain username and password, if you add some kind of like authenticator app on top of that, or even like SMS verification or email verification, it's going to be it's going to increase the strength of user authentication. So my answer to this would be like use multi-factor authentication or, or two-factor authentication as, as you might hear it. And from a technical standpoint, um, depending on how the authentication is being implemented, there's like a lot of different ways, technically speaking, that you can increase the strength of authentication. So for example, there was a credential breach in LinkedIn in, in 2012, and those the credentials got stolen and they were all hashed with SHA-1 and they were unsalted, for example. So it's like pretty easy to go through and like crack all those hashes. So to kind of prevent that, they could have used, you know, either a stronger hashing algorithm like SHA-256, or they could have uh, salted the hashes, and that would have kind of increased the authentic authentication strength, at least putting a, a deterrent in the way that prevent the, you know, hashes from being cracked. So in my opinion, there's kind of a lot of different ways you can answer this. I wasn't sure if this question was asking for uh, like the deep technical ways that you can strengthen the authentication or what. I might have asked more questions to the interview if there's a human in front of me. And, but kind of looking back, there's a bunch of other stuff I could have said, you know, like password policies, like password lockout policies, password length requirements and, and those kind of things. So you can just Google. Um, you can use my original answer and build on top of it. I felt like such a basic question, I could have answered it better. But yeah, moving on to the next one. So the next question is, how would you defend against a cross-site scripting attack? So basically, cross-site scripting is when you have some kind of dynamic aspect to a web page, like somewhere where a user can enter information and like post a message, like a message board or a comment section or something. Um, when users inject code into their like inside a HTML script tag or something like this, they inject JavaScript. And then when other users browse to that page, that JavaScript is executed on their browser. So that's kind of what cross-site scripting is. So to kind of prevent that, of course, you, you can just put controls to prevent people from actually injecting code into dynamic places on web on web pages like preventing them from entering code into comment sections or message boards or or any kind of thing like this so this question i would say it's it's pretty a pretty good one it kind of well, of course, like tests if you even know what cross-site scripting is, and then kind of takes it a step further and asking like how you would go about preventing that. And it, it cross-site scripting isn't like super difficult and like super technical, but at least shows like uh, that you're aware that it exists and maybe like shows like a little bit of your knowledge about code and, and web applications and that kind of thing. So this is a pretty good question. Um, cross-site scripting is also part of OWASP top 10. Uh, so just take note of that and then maybe take that as an indicator to to kind of look into OWASP top 10 and make sure you kind of understand those top 10 uh, vulnerabilities. It will be really useful in, in future interviews, I'm sure. And the next question is, what is the difference between TCP and UDP? So there's a lot of differences between these two protocols. One's transmission control protocol and the other is user, user datagram protocol or user datagram protocol. I would say the kind of the main high level difference is TCP is connection oriented. Uh, that is, it kind of keeps track of what's sent and like what's received and kind of ensures that the last thing was received before it sends more. And it has like a lot of other features in it, like sequence numbers and windowing, where it kind of increases the amount of data that's being sent based on how fast the receiving end is able to receive it. So it, when you send things that are like imperative, that the whole thing you want to send gets sent, you typically will use TCP. And then UDP is con considered like connectionless and it's good for streaming, streaming audio or streaming video where it may not be like completely imperative that all the data gets sent. Uh, maybe you some packets get dropped along the way, but that's okay because you can keep streaming and sending kind of the, the rest of the message. So for this question, there's like a lot of different ways you can answer it because there's so many things that go into both like TCP and UDP, but I, I think if you, you know, oh, I, I failed to mention like the three way handshake with TCP and like how the connection is, is established. But I'm pretty sure if you if you mention like, you know, connection oriented versus 
connection list and then you say what they they stand for and kind of give like a decent high level explanation that's probably good enough because you know to get much deeper than that is it will be really impressive if you start talking about flags and in this type of thing or, or talking about the headers and stuff but um yeah just basically understand that they're you know connection lists versus connection oriented you know if you understand the basic level that's usually good enough if they're asking you this type of question so the next question is how do you keep yourself up to date with news and different technologies so i like to use i primarily use podcasts to be honest um my favorite podcast is darknet diaries and listening to that kind of gives you an idea of like the different stories that kind of happen all around the world uh, in terms of like cybersecurity and like kind of stuff that happens behind the scenes and it's really interesting because kind of gives me a perspective on like like what people have done to accomplish different things and kind of what's possible in the world. For news news, I listen to the Cyberwire podcast. They come out with episodes like pretty much daily. It's really high quality and it, it really keeps, it's good for keeping like up to date on different breaches and different like kind of activities around the world. For as far as Twitter goes, I follow HackerOne and the Hacker News uh, as well as Cyber Command and like a couple of other like US agency type cyber accounts um i don't i don't use twitter that much i kind of keep an eye on it and look at it but i i don't I don't get too active on it. I primarily just listen to podcasts and like take a look at Twitter once in a while. For this question, I don't know if there's like a really correct answer or not. I know I know a lot of people use Twitter in the cybersecurity kind of industry or the cybersecurity world. Um, I honestly just don't use it that much because I don't really care about it. Um, if I'm at a job that like requires me to like look at it more, like maybe maybe I will. But if you want to be impressive, maybe like figure out who's like the cool accounts to follow on Twitter or something and follow them so you can kind of talk about them a little bit more. Um, I'll definitely check out the Cyberwire for kind of daily news and Darknet Diaries. Definitely, if you haven't listened to that, you should go and listen to like all the episodes right now. But yeah, that's it for this one. And the next question and kind of last one for this segment is how do you prevent data loss and server interruptions? So pr to prevent data loss, it kind of depends on where your data is being stored and like the whole setup and like all this, there's many different factors you can kind of consider. But if you're considering like a single server, you might implement some form of RAID like maybe a RAID 1, which is mirroring, or a RAID 5, which is striping with parity, or a RAID 6, which is the same as RAID 5, except for you kind of get an extra disk where two disks can fail and you can still maintain all of your data. So consider RAID or consider some other kind of form of high availability, like clustering or like a complete like rep replica server. Or if you're talking about in terms of enterprise, you can have like a completely like hot site with like everything duplicated at like a, a separate site in case one of the sites gets destroyed by a fire or something like this and to prevent like interruptions um, again just high availability it depends on what you're preventing from being uh, interrupted in and, and all of this stuff but so for example if you're a business and you need to maintain internet connectivity you can have like a backup ISP or something with like gateway load balancing protocol um, or you know some kind of failover protocol when your primary like pipe or like internet connect connection goes down it switches over so just implement like some form of redundancy and some form of high availability so th this question is fairly simple i would say and there's like kind of a million different ways to answer it again i probably could have answered it better but those are kind of some ideas that you can talk about when answering this question you could i didn't even talk about cloud actually looking back so you can talk about cloud a little bit talk about like implementing like geo redundancy in the cloud in case like you know whatever the data center in washington blows up maybe you still have the one in in san francisco or something like this um, but if you just mention like some form of redundancy or some form of um, uh, high availability or some kind of backup. I didn't, I didn't talk about backups, but yeah, I would, I would mention backups in this. Um, but there's like a lot of different ways you can answer it. Just kind of think about it and then pick a way that kind of sounds impressive. Uh, if someone said to me what I said in my initial answer, I'd be like, okay, they've mentioned like enough things to where, you know, they probably know other things as well. And they have a pretty good understanding of it. So yeah, that's it for this session. Um, if you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe and look forward to the next one. All right. Thank you and see you later.